the fields. We want to measure current and flux, density, temperature, velocity, lots of things. And each of these things covers wide dynamic ranges, wide frequency ranges. Um, there's differences in, in measurements depending on species um, for particles. So uh, there's no magic instrument that goes out in space and measures everything for you. And consequently, there's no magic scientist who can teach you about all in situ instruments. But I'll do my best, especially in the fields area. This is from the Van Allen probes here. We have uh, DC magnetic field, AC magnetic field, DC electric field, AC electric field. This is just the fields measurement. And you can see it gets split into a lot of different in instruments. There's a flux gate magnetometer. We'll talk about those. Surge coil magnetometer at higher frequencies. For the electric field at low frequencies, there's a, a double probe. We'll talk about those. Um, there's also wave measurements at higher, higher frequencies. Um, and, and so, um, so you can't just do it with one instrument. Even within some of these instruments, there's divided into these, these nominal instruments. It's divided into a low range sensor and a high range sensor. And so you, you occasionally have to worry about intercalibration between those different things. Um, here's now the particle instruments. There's electrons, protons, ions. Uh, you see the same names pop up, but again, that's usually a different instrument within that instrument package. Um, and so uh, energy ranges matter, species matter. You have to adapt your instrument to what you are trying to measure. Um, I'm going to start off talking about particle detectors. That's sort of where I'm most familiar uh, with different designs. I uh, talk a little bit about uh, two or three different types of magnetic field sensors, and then I'm going to focus really just on one type of electric field sensor. Uh, throughout, I'll try and put in a bunch of different example instruments from current or upcoming missions. So there are a lot of different instruments out there, a lot of instrument choices when you're designing a mission, but in the end, um, lots, of in lots of missions tend to come up with sort of uh, in heliophysics, for in situ measurements anyway, a whole similar set of, um, of instruments. There's almost always a low energy particle instrument, a high energy particle instrument, uh, if you're lucky, um, a flux gate magnetometer for low frequency magnetic fields, because those are always going to be important, a surge coil ma magnetometer for higher frequency fields, and an electric field instrument. These are the things that go into plasma equations, so we need to measure them. Um, so focusing on particle detectors, there, this is a book came out almost 20 years now, so it sounds old, but in terms of instrumentation, we don't adapt that quickly. So, um, so it's, it's one that I still go back to. Um, the, uh, I also recommend Radiation Detection and Measurement by Knoll. Um, it's probably where I learned most of my sort of detector building um, textbook. Uh, level experience, but not particularly adapted for space use. Um, so how does this work? How do you actually get a measurement of an energetic particle? Um, well, photons, you know, they can, uh, x-rays, gamma rays, they can penetrate uh, detectors. They usually stop in very discrete ways, right? They have a photoelectric effect, Compton scatter, or pair produce. And so these are, are discrete events. For electrons and protons and ions that are interacting with your detector, they tend to lose energy as they go along, right? They slow down as they pass through matter, right? And they're primarily interacting with the electrons in the matter, right? And that means um, that an electron will interact with the matter very differently than a proton, right? You, um, you interact most strongly when the velocity of the energetic particle is approximately the same as the Fermi speed in the material. Right. <coughs> For higher energy particles, um, there's sort of this classic beta block formula. Um, the en rate of energy loss is inversely proportional to energy. It, this doesn't apply all the time, and it doesn't really work for electrons. Um, so, uh, uh, this can be used to calculate a range, and as I said, this, this is most useful for ions. Um, these days, a lot of 
instrument design or, or understanding of an instrument response comes from simulating your instrument. Um, it's good to do actual calibration data, but simulating your instrument can, uh, can really improve your design and certainly your understanding of the response. So um, I'll point out a couple things. Uh, NIST website especially has uh, really easy access to E star, P star, and A star, which give you these uh, energy loss rate uh, graphs. So you can sort of see how things are, um, are moving through matter. Casino is my favorite for really quick electron simulations. Um, it's free, it's downloadable, it's really easy to use, and uh, I've seen it uh, shoot down proposals for new instruments in about 10 minutes of simulation. Uh, so they wrote a 15-page proposal, and I did a 10-minute simulation, and showed that their instrument wouldn't work. Right? So do these simulations. Right? Um, they're really useful. Uh, SRIM trim is basically the, the equivalent for ions. Uh, it's a really quick, simple um, ion simulation. And then uh, JAUNT is sort of the, the overarching one. It's a Monte Carlo simulation where you can you can simulate complex instruments and their response to almost anything. So this is from that NIST website. This is electron energy loss in silicon. You can see it starts off relatively high. This is called stopping power. It's a little bit of a weird unit. But basically, this is related to the amount of energy loss per unit path length in the silicon. All right, so it starts off higher and then decreases gets to about an MeV of electron energy coming in, the energy loss rate flattens out. It flattens out at about 2 MeV per gram per centimeter squared, or 2 MeV centimeter squared per gram. Right? So you multiply that by the um, density of, alumina, of uh, silicon, 2.32 grams per centimeter cubed, and you can, you can measure, you can estimate what the minimum deposition for these higher energy electrons will be in your silicon detector. Silicon's a really common choice for high energy particle detectors. So um, if I have a thousand micron or a millimeter thick slab of silicon, and I have a multi MeV electron coming in, it will be depositing this minimum energy. It'll actually be losing energy faster than that, but a lot of that energy is going into photons. A lot of that is going into Bremsstrahlung. Right, so you can only, as a detector builder, count on this red curve for the measurement you're making. So you put that multi-MeV electron in, and you only get 464 keV out of it. Right? So you do not stop that electron, and you do not correctly identify its energy, and it has gone through your detector. Right? So you need to be aware that penetrating particles are happening all the time. Electrons can penetrate through a millimeter of uh, silicon pretty easily. Protons in silicon, you can see if I flip back and forth, this is uh, an order of magn magnitude higher stopping power, especially at low energy. But over here at very high energies, it's actually approaching the same minimum ionizing energy. Right? So very energetic protons will also punch right through your detectors. And sometimes you can actually take advantage of that, as we'll see later. But, um, but you, you have to be aware of that full energy deposition doesn't happen just because you put a piece of silicon out there. Uh, so combining those two, this is sort of a uh, different populations that we see a lot of. And, and there's the electron curve and the proton curve. The electron curve got shifted up a little bit, it looks like. Uh, if you switch now to alpha particles in silicon, that curve is shifted up and to the right a little bit, even from the proton curve. Right? And that shift that gradually happens with increasing mass of your incoming particle lets you do species differentiation at high energies, too. We'll see that again later. <coughs> so electrons and ions behave very differently due to the different mass ratio. The, the primary interaction, again, is with the sea of electrons. So ions interact with sort of a um, distant collisions. Each interaction is small, so ions tend to move in relatively straight lines um, as they move through the, um, through the matter. Electrons can lose a large fraction of their energy in a single interaction, and they can go huge, undergo huge changes in momentum. 
So you can't count on them to move in straight lines. Uh, when an electron hits an atom, large angle deflections, I just said that. The other thing that happens with, with electrons is Bremsstrahlung, breaking radiation, produced when electrons undergo extreme accelerations. X-rays are easily generated, um, especially when they strike high Z materials. And these X-rays will penetrate to the rest of your spacecraft, the rest of your instrument. And so it can be a source of background as well. Um, and that's a good reason to avoid high Z materials on the exterior of your spacecraft. Luckily, we mostly put aluminum on the exterior of our spacecraft. So this is Casino. Um, there's a website right there. You can go and check it out. Again, I said it's super easy to use. And this is what it ends up looking like. Uh, this is a simulation of 30 keV electrons in silicon. This is um, something close to uh, 80 microns total depth shown on the left. Um, and this is average value, or this is the histogram of depth. So I put 30 keV electrons into the silicon. You know, some people would say, oh, well, on average, they stop at 45 microns, or that's the median. Um, but you can see that they are following crazy paths through your silicon. Right? Yeah. So it's a Monte Carlo simulation. So um, it, it's got a library of cross sections, and it's doing um, sort of just an estimate of uh, DPD theta and things like that. It's much simpler than that, right? It's it's uh, it's you put in an electron beam, which is coming in right here, um, and it is uh, it is calculating a cross section per unit length, basically, um, and it can do a pretty small uh, spatial step, something like an angstrom, and in that distance, it's calculating all the possible cross sections that are relevant for that en energy electron, and um, and randomly choosing one based on the cross-section, and then applying that and stepping it forward in time. One thing that's important is, especially at moderate energies, uh, electrons, a lot of them get backscattered. So there's an efficiency that you never even see all of these 16% of electrons that get kicked out really quickly. These are the red trajectories. Some of them go quite a ways in before escaping from your material. So you're not always stopping the particles you think you're measuring, and you need to design that into your instruments. For ion simulations, remember this is 30 keV into silicon, goes 45 microns. For ions, in, a, in the ion simulation package that I recommend, it goes 0.3 microns. And the vertical spread here, it's not on the same scale, is much, much tighter especially at the start. Right? As they slow down at the end, they sort of drift a little bit. Um, so this is the, that 0 0.3 micron depth. One thing about ions is um, detectors often have what we call a dead layer. This one is simulated at 400 angstroms. And a lot of the energy, a lot of the initial energy, um, in fact, the most per unit angstrom is lost in this front layer. Um, so, um, so any sort of absorber material in front of a detector really strongly affects ions, especially in these, this energy range. Okay. This is what the simulation looks like. Um, as I said, it's pretty simple. simple. This is trim. You just specify layers of different materials, and it does um, most of the rest. But the last time I used this for an actual uh, instrument design was to decide how thick of an absorber I wanted in front of my detector. Right? I knew that I wanted to stop stuff below 400 keV protons from entering my detector. So I simulated this. 350 keV electrons, this is aluminum, a plastic, and an aluminum, and then here's my detector. And you can see for normal incidence, which is going to be the worst case, 350 keV electrons or protons don't make it through my thin foil. So I can use this thin foil to filter out everything below 350 keV protons. Okay? 400 keV protons do make it through. And in fact, the transition happens pretty quickly, um, somewhere in between here. So um, 
now I am getting deposits in my detector over here of energy from the 400 keV protons. So this is the sort of thing that's really useful on an instrument design, try and make quick decisions um, about what to, what to put in front of your detector as an absorber. And we'll see this technique as of putting in sort of a, an ion filter to cover your electron instrument um, or to limit the range of your uh, ion response is pretty common. This is Jayant. This is, uh, it was designed for CERN for high energy particle accelerators. And it's on its fourth iteration, which is now in C++. Some people find Jayant to be completely opaque. Um, I find C++ to be completely opaque. Um, but luckily, there's a Jayant 3 that's written in Fortran, and I still love that. So, um, so uh, you can build, in, indeed, you, know, you can build up all of CERN, or you can build up your whole satellite, and you can build up your specific detector. Um, there are lots of really great tutorials on the JNOT website. I recommend if you're ever interested in simulating an instrument, you can, you can use JNOT, a complete instrument. Uh, this is sort of a, a JNOT project that I'm working on right now with a student. This is a collimator for a detector. You want to limit your field of view. And these are electrons. And you can see, again, they scatter like crazy in your collimator. So you actually have to be careful. Um, not to just trust the geometric field of view of your um, collimator as the thing that limits your actual field of view. So electrons penetrate very well. They scatter very easily. Um, they are much more strongly affected by magnetic fields. Ions stop quickly, relatively, and they tend to follow pretty straight line trajectories. Um, and there are good software tools for you to use if you want to simulate things quickly. So basic types of detectors for, um, for particles. Uh, low energy, less than 50 keV. I will say no energy determination. That's not entirely true. Um, less energy determination, maybe. Uh, I'll talk about a Faraday cup. I won't really talk about a Langmuir probe. Uh, Langmuir probe is going to give you density and temperature. Faraday cup, we'll see in just a minute. Um, channel electron multipliers and, and microchannel plates are common actual sensing of the electron or the proton or the ion. Uh, and then high energy, we'll talk about um, mostly solid state detectors. So a Faraday cup is actually a really simple instrument in concept. Um, it's measuring the current from an ion beam. Right? It's got a deep cup. It's usually got some sort of. Uh, negative potential somewhere to repel photoelectrons from affecting your current or to repel electrons um, from entering your cup in this case. Um, so you, you let an ion beam, anytime you have a strong flow, you, have, you can call it an ion beam. So the solar wind is a good example. Uh, and it comes in and you just measure the current. Right? It's actually a pretty simple measurement. In practice, that's a little too simple. Um, this is the Faraday cup still in use on wind, so 25 years later. Um, they've estimated its drift at 0.01% per year, so it's a very stable instrument. Um, it's useful for um, operating in incredibly harsh environments, as we'll see. Um, in practice, you, you don't just sort of measure the current. What you do is rather clever. You have grids sitting in front of your collector, right? And you modulate a voltage on these grids, right? So you move the voltage up and down, up and down. And what that does is it will particularly modulate the measured current at the energy corresponding to the voltage you're sweeping, right? And so you can actually get the uh, energy distribution. It's not the, the full energy distribution. It's the normal incidence energy distribution. Um, but by modulating these grids, you measure a modulated current. Right? This is the Faraday cup for Solar Probe Plus. It looks almost identical to the one um, <coughs> that's flying on wind for 25 years. This is the actual collector plate. 
you can see they split it into four pieces. And by looking at ratios of currents on each of these four pieces, they can determine the flow direction of the solar wind to something better than a degree, right? which is really impressive. Unlike wind, this is made of some sort of sapphire, because this has to sit out in the solar wind at perihelion and, and look at the sun. So um, except for thermal considerations, this is very similar to wind. Um, but again, here, here's their modulation grids. They measure a current onto their collector plates back here. They're applying this, this uh, oscillating voltage up front. And um, the earliest ones didn't do this oscillation. They sort of did an absolute value. But that has a lot of systematic errors. So by stepping through and modulating, what you're actually doing is really isolating this part without hardly any systematic errors. And for the green section, you can see that the amplitude of the current is larger. That's what this picture is supposed to show, because that's where the peak in your distribution is. <coughs> uh, so it's simple, it's reliable, it's stable. Um, it's got a few things. Like you don't want to have vibrations around it um, because the grid's moving, creates a capacitive coupling into your detector. Um, it's not a very sensitive instrument, but if you're sitting out in the solar wind, you have a lot of um, a lot of material to work with. So it's uh, <coughs> it's good for that type of situation. They tend to be pretty large uh, as a particle detector goes for a given uh, sensitivity. Uh, a very simple detector, or a very simple sensor, uh, is the channel electron multiplier. It works because um, if I put in some sort of incoming radiation to, uh, to a, a coated surface that I'm going to get a secondary electrons from, I then apply a high voltage through this whole tube, across this whole tube, that accelerates the electrons down the tube. And as they hit the walls of this tube, they create extra secondary electrons. You get three to five per impact, something like that. And you get thousands and thousands of impacts. So uh, you get exponential growth. And over here, you get um, huge gain. So even a single relatively low energy electron or photon or proton or ion hitting this front surface gets you something like 10 to the sixth electrons coming out at the end of the tube. And so you can definitely count 10 to the sixth electrons. Right? That's a very measurable signal. It's a quick pulse. These are really good at high counting rates. Right? This is 10 million counts per second. Uh, we'll talk later about silicon detectors. A lot of times they start to crap out. They start to suffer from deleterious effects at, at uh, 20,000 counts per second, 40,000 counts per second. If you're really lucky, you can get up to 100,000 counts per second. So these are good at very high counting rates. And they're good to very low energies. But, <clears throat> but it's just one sort of small measurement point. And so one of the things you can do is effectively use the same technique of having lots of little tubes, and you can spread out a whole bunch of them. And then you get what we call a microchannel plate. Again, it's sensitive to x-rays, electrons, ions, low energy stuff, uh, UV. Um, <coughs> you apply a voltage so that when the secondary electrons are created, they're accelerated downward. Um, this is sort of a five micron diameter hole. You frequently have 40 to 1 or 80 to 1 or 100 to 1 um, longer depth of the hole, of the tube. And so um, you get many, many interactions. That's what's going, shown here. Um, and you get, for a simple sort of relatively short uh, thickness, you get about 10 to the 3 electrons coming out for each individual particle coming in. And you can actually put these in position-sensitive detectors, where you have multiple anodes over here. And that way, you can, you can have effectively an imaging plane of your microchannel plate. Right? So an electron that comes in here will trigger this anode, an electron that comes in here will trigger this one. And you can actually do sort of imaging plates, imaging in a particle sense um, with microchannel plates. This is, uh, this is sort of the standard configuration. It's got two of these, two of these, um, and they are 
slightly tilted. That's for a couple reasons. One, it guarantees that the accelerating voltage causes the electron to hit the walls really well, um, which gets you the multiplication. And, uh, and it reduces a process where ions generated in, the, uh, in any of these interactions or any, any interactions in the gas that might be residual in here from going back the other way and starting a sort of a re-triggered pulse. Um, so um, pretty simple detector. Uh, very sensitive, especially at low energies. You see the sensitivity to electrons peaks around 1 keV. It goes all the way down to um, much lower energy. <coughs> For protons, effectively going down to near zero with still a measurable sensitivity. Photons um, with different wavelength here and, um, and sort of uh, soft x-rays over here. What do you do with these things? Well, you can't just stick them out and measure the particles because they're sensitive to everything, right? They're sensitive to electrons, protons, photons. And so they, they usually, uh, and they're held at high voltage, so you have to be careful about them uh, attracting the plasma in. So you usually bury these behind some other instrument, some other system for limiting and sorting the particles. One of the common ones is an electrostatic analyzer. This is called a top hat analyzer. Uh, it's two concentric spheres or near spheres. And electrons or protons will come in. You held one outer plate and one inner plate at different potentials. In this case, a positive potential in the inner plate relative to the outer potential. And that electric field will deflect some electrons or some desired particle, we'll say, along the trajectory such that it doesn't hit the wall and get lost. Right? And what I can do is by changing this applied voltage, I can choose different uh, energies that are allowed to pass through this curved path length. Right? And by flipping the polarity, I can measure um, particles of a different charge sign. Right? So I can measure electrons with one polarity and ions with another. Right? Um, you, the top hat geometry is nice because if you imagine this was spun around as an axis of symmetry right here, I can look at a whole wedge of the particle population, a whole disk of the particle population. This is uh, frequently sort of uh, seven degree, six degree, eight degrees, something like that, acceptance angle. But then in the other, in the azimuth, you have 180 degrees of uh, field of view. So you can do quite a lot with that. Uh, one problem is that you do have to step your electric field to measure different electrons or different particles. And so you're not measuring the same particles uh, as a function of time. You're measuring 1 keV, and then you raise your voltage, and you're measuring 2 keV or 5 keV. You step your voltage again. You can step through voltages pretty quickly on the order of milliseconds. Um, and so you know, on the order of a second or a few seconds or a spin period or some part of a spin period, you can measure all the electrons or all the protons. Uh, and of course, back here, the actual detector is a microchannel plate. And it's segmented so that you can get this azimuthal angular resolution. Um, there is also, and it didn't come out very dark, but there is an energy angle response to an electrostatic analyzer. So you're getting a slightly different energy as a function of angle. And that's because um, an electron that's coming in at a slightly canted angle is instead of uh, true horizontal, at a different energy, it will manage to avoid the plates just slightly. Uh, if you put this on a spinning spacecraft, here's that full 180 degree by 8 degree wide field of view. If you spin, then spin this around, you get full 4 pi field of view. Um, sometimes you can't be on a spinning spacecraft. Solar Probe Plus, for instance, is not a spinning spacecraft. Um, and so one of the things you can do when you're not able to spin this field of view is deflect. So now here's this electrostatic analyzer. And sitting out in front of it, we have now another pair of surfaces that we apply a potential to. And we can steer our field of view up and down in azimuth. Right, by, doing, by applying different uh, potentials here. This is simulated with 5 degrees, so it's uh, 5 keV ions. Um, 
right now, and you can see this is the maximum deflection you're getting. We're applying a pretty large potential uh, down here <coughs> so that uh, our field of view has gone from being somewhere over here, six degrees wide, to somewhere up here, six degrees wide. And that lets you look around. But now you've got another uh, parameter that you're stepping through. So your ability to build up the sort of the full four pi distribution is now both the energy steps and the deflection steps. Here's an example of an electric static analyzer. This is from Themis, which is still operating. Um, this is, uh, here they took an ion ESA and an electron ESA and stacked them back to back. This is what it looks like in practice. This is the CAD model of it. You can see, um, except for uh, the electronics over here, they're, they're looking at 180 degree field of view out these slots. Um, the ion one and the electron one are separated so that uh, you don't need to be flipping high voltage around. You can measure ions and electrons at the same time. This is not very large. This is uh, sort of on the order of 10 centimeters. Um, and uh, and they, tend to, they tend to be very stable. They tend to stick around for a long time, uh, not drift too much in calibration. This is a slightly more complicated one. This is from Maven Static. This is actually the one that uh, SPAN on Solar Probe is designed after, um, or SPAN A. SPAN got also chopped up into multiple um, uh, different instruments. Uh, here you can see these are the deflectors. Here's your top hat analyzer. The, the new thing here, or a couple new things to note here. Um, here's a mechanical attenuator. So especially when on a project like MAVEN, where they are moving um, on a high elliptic orbit down into relatively low altitude around Mars, out to much, much higher around Mars, where fluxes are much, much lower, you need to design your instrument to handle that dynamic range. The same thing is happening for probe, because they need to handle uh, several orders of magnitude of different flux, depending on which perihelion they're talking about. Right? So this mechanical attenuator right here, in this picture, moves up and down, and it limits the amount of electrons that have access, or the amount of ions that have access to the rest of the optic, the rest of the particle optic. Right? Some other things that happen here that are new is the addition of what we call time of flight. Uh, this is good at measuring E, or really it's measuring E over Q, uh, energy per unit charge, uh, in the electrostatic deflection uh, zone up here. But uh, sometimes you want to know what E actually is, or you want to know what the mass of the particle was. Right? And so the way to get at that is to measure its velocity. So if you know E over Q and you know velocity and a few assumptions, you can actually measure, um, you can identify different species, which is important for the solar wind. It certainly was also important at Mars for atmospheric escape. So what happens is after the electrostatic deflection zone, particles that made it through, we know they're E over Q. Um, they are accelerated through, in this case, 15 kilovolts of potential. Then they hit a very thin carbon foil. When they hit that carbon foil, it hardly affects them at all, because they are massive ions. Um, but it kicks out a whole bunch of what we call start electrons, which are collected over here on um, uh, right there. Um, on what we call the start anode, which is a microchannel plate again. Right? So we know what time it passed through this start foil. And we know that it is its initial E over Q plus 15 kilovolts accelerated down through this region. This is about two centimeters here. And then we pass it through another foil, and it has a stop pulse. Again, we collect the electrons on that. Um, and we then know how much time it took for it to go through this two centimeters. Right? So we know its velocity. We know E over Q and we know velocity. We know a lot about that particle. <coughs> so this allows ma mass determination, which is an important science requirement for a lot of these instruments. When you go to more energetic particle detectors, solid state detectors are one of the most common. Um, they're uh, historically, we're sort of only used above 20 keV. You can get them down to lower energies than that, but um, that's harder, and 
Uh, it's more susceptible to ultraviolet light, and, and it's um, not always a great idea. You typically run them what we call fully depleted. These are effectively reverse bias diodes where you, you apply a reverse voltage to the silicon, and that lets you um, get a, an electric field throughout, which is now the electric field that lets you collect your particles or your, the current from, from your particles. Uh, they aren't typically very thick. Th typically, sort of a millimeter is, is the thickest ballpark. And that, because of those uh, energy loss curves, will define the sort of max energy uh, particle that you can reliably stop. Um, you can get thicker ones. Uh, lithium drifted silicon, you can get sort of three, five millimeter. Um, I've never worked with anything that thick. Um, they are not as stable. And so um, they aren't used nearly as often. You can use high purity germanium. You also have to keep that cold if you want good performance. Um, it's expensive. It's large Z. It has high, better stopping power than uh, silicon. Um, you can make them very big. Uh, and it's generally used for x-rays and gamma rays because that's where you need the real stopping power. Uh, CZT, cad zinc telluride, uh, is actually a, a pretty rapidly improving I think, uh, choice. Um, and it's a lot cheaper than germanium. How does a solid state detector work? Well, it's a, as I said, it's a reverse bias diode. You apply an electric field to this slab of silicon. And an energetic particle comes in, and it leaves an ionization trail. For every 3.6 EV that the, that the incoming particle has uh, that creates ionization, you get an electron hole pair. So if I put in a 3.6 keV particle, I get 1,000 electron hole pairs generated in my silicon. Right? And 1,000 electrons is a tiny electrical signal, but it's a measurable electrical signal. Right? So I apply this field, usually sort of 30 to a couple hundred volts, um, depending on the type of silicon. And, uh, and then I collect the current. I measure the current effectively. How do I do that? Well, uh, this is maybe in the weeds for some people, but um, it's reasonable to think about it. Um, here's my detector. I get my 1,000 electrons. I suddenly collect a lot of charge on what we call a charge-sensitive amplifier. Uh, that lets me get a voltage as a function of time. This is sort of uh, still very noisy. I put that through a shaper circuit, which averages out that noise, and it stretches it out. And two microseconds is sort of a, a common ballpark number, depending on s some of the other parameters of your detector, like what electronics you have here and the capacitance of your detector. Um, but that also kind of sets your maximum count rate, right? Two microseconds uh, is 500 kilohertz, but there's lots of other times that have to get added. Um, and so this is sort of one of the reasons why uh, you can't count too fast with solid state detectors. Uh, you, you take that shaped pulse, which is now nice and smooth, and you split it up. You can measure the height of that pulse. And you do that, you say, oh, well, once I'm above some threshold, I want to um, tell an analog to digital converter to measure its height. When do you want to measure its height? You want to measure its height at its peak. The way you do that is by putting your signal through an analog differentiator, right, which is taking the derivative of that signal. And then when the derivative goes through zero, with a, a pretty simple electronics there, that's when you fire your analog to digital converter. You measure the pulse height. So by measuring the height of that pulse, you actually get all the way back to that original number of electron hole pairs that were created. Right? So this is how silicon detectors do pulse height analysis, or PHA. You'll see pop up on other slides. Um, and this is how they do energy determination. But they're only doing energy determination. Right? They don't know if it was an electron or an ion or a photon. Silicon is, is a garbage collector. It's just whatever energy you put into it, it tells you that's what energy you saw. Uh, 
So you have to have some other scheme of determining what you just saw. Right? Well, one thing is if you don't want electrons, you can put a big magnetic field in front of your detector. Right? We call these broom magnets. A broom magnet will sweep out most electrons because they have these tight gyro radii in large fields. Right? And that way you say, oh, I know it could still be a photon or it could be an ion. And probably it's not a whole lot of photons because I'm not looking at a flare that instant, something like that. Um, so I know it's an ion. I can identify it's an ion if I sweep out all my electrons. Right? Or I can put a thin foil in front. If I only want electrons, thin foils are good at stopping ions, but not so good at stopping electrons. So putting a thin foil limits the, the species in that way. I can use electrostatic deflection, like in the electrostatic analyzers. It's hard to do that as you get to higher and higher energies. Um, or one of the most common ones is to stack multiple slabs of silicon and look at the energy loss per unit path length, which if you go back to those E star, P star energy loss curves, you can use that um, to measure species type. So this is the Themis SST. It was stacked silicon of three pieces, or is stacked silicon of three pieces. And it's what we call a double-ended telescope. So it's looking at um, particles coming in this way, particles coming in this way. On one side, they put a big magnet, samarium cobalt magnet. This is going to sweep out most of the electrons below about 400 keV. Over here, they put a thin foil, the one that we simulated earlier. And it's going, to sweep, it's going to stop ions below about 400 keV. So then by looking at coincident events in these central detectors, I can sort of filter out other things. Right? If a detector is depositing energy in, in the F detector, but not in T or O, it ends up looking like this. And you can see these are mo the red ones are mostly due to moderate energy electrons. Right? If I have F plus T, both uh, the energy deposited here and energy deposited here. Well, then if I compare the detector F energy to the detector T energy, I can clearly see I have electron region, a proton region, and a helium-4 region. Right? So by stacking these and looking at energy ratios in the silicon, I can get uh, species identification. Right? This is, again, Jayant simulations. Uh, in both cases, but they did confirm this in an um, ion beam study, ion and electron beams. Now, putting a magnetic broom magnet on a spacecraft that is also measuring the magnetic field uh, is one of those places where scientists get to fight. Uh, it's exciting times. Um, so, so you very rarely just put a broom magnet, a very simple broom magnet. This is what the Themis broom magnet looked like. And it's a couple of oppositely oriented dipoles with uh, what we call magnetic yokes. And so the stray fields at two meters where the magnetometers were out on a boom is less than one and a half nanotesla. And it's a, it's a constant field. So it's, it's pretty easy to deal with that um, level of contamination. Well, I say it's easy because I'm a particle guy. The magnetometer people might you know, disagree with that. Uh, you can also use magnetic field to actually sort your particles. Right? Magnetic spectrometers are um, a great way to sort electrons because if I apply a magnetic field into the page here, what I see is electrons of higher energy have larger gyro radii. And so they will intersect my image plane over here. Lower energy electrons will come and intersect at a tighter gyro radii. So now I can separate electrons of different energy without ever having them touch anything. And that's a pretty powerful thing. And of course, ions that come in my aperture here, they'll head off this way with a very large gyro radii. This is from the Mag Ice instrument paper. I think I haven't said it enough. You should go read instrument papers. They're sometimes too big of sections on electronics, but uh, you can skip those. They're still worth reading. Uh, Mag Ice is. Again, nominally one instrument, but it gets divided into three different energy ranges, low, medium, and high. You're sorting uh, the electrons, as I said, by gyro radii. But then you're also, over here, doing pole site analysis with the 
um, with the silicon that you have over here. Um, and that lets you do two independent measurements of the energy. You measure its energy with gyro radii, and you measure its energy by how much energy it drops in the silicon. And then what that is really useful for is, is uh, it allows for great background rejection. I can have a cosmic ray that comes through uh, this detector or this detector. I have probably just as many based on their ratio of their areas. Um, those will leave amounts of energy that are different than what you would expect for something that satisfied the gyro radio requirement. So this is a great technique when you have lots of penetrating radiation. So it was very useful in the radiation belts. And it's a very clean measurement. Um, if you go now to ISIS on uh, Solar Probe Plus, which is unfortunately named, but I don't think they knew it at the time. Um, it's again divided into multiple instruments. This is, uh, I think, sometimes called the mushroom. Um, epi low, and then epi high is again divided into three separate a low. Epi high low, and epi high low, and epi high high. Uh, low one, low, I think it's low one, low two, and high. Um, so epi low does, again, this time of flight measurement, but now it does it with a mix of microchannel plates and silicon. So I have an ion coming in, and I get a start foil again. I get, now I have a stop foil over here. Um, and I have an SSD now to measure its, its energy. So now I measure energy and pulse height, but unlike on the uh, uh, energy from pulse height and velocity from time of flight, unlike on the um, span measurement, um, I don't have an S, uh, a microchannel plate over here. I have an SSD, so I get a, another measurement of energy. So this allows for species identification. They do somewhat better on this aperture, the ones out on the ring, um, presumably because there's a longer uh, time of flight region. But you can see in, for these outer apertures, they're doing a really good job of, of uh, identifying by comparing the time of flight in nanoseconds to the total energy they measure. And that lets them sort by mass. Right? Um, for these very vertical ones where the time of flight is shorter, things get a little tighter. Um, but they're still able to do helium-3, helium-4 separation, which is pretty impressive and important for Solar Probe Plus. Um, what the, those epi, the ISIS uh, epi high is divided into let one, let two, and het, low energy, um, low energy two, and high energy, so it's epi high low, epi high low two, epi high high. Um, but as I said, you have to chop up these energy ranges into some sort of measurable way. Um, and so this is using, again, stacked silicon, except it's many more stacks than those Themis stacks of three. So they have whatever, one through eight here, eight stacked silicons in let one, uh, seven in let two, and I don't even want to count in HET. Um, and again, what they're doing is they're looking for a coincident uh, trajectory through a whole bunch of these, and they're looking at how the particle is losing energy as it passes through. Um, and doing that, this is what LET looks like. They do a little bit of pixelation, which also helps because they can look at how much, of a, how much the trajectory is slanted, because that obviously changes your path length through the detector. Um, so this is um, pixelated, so they know which sector it hits. These are what we call wire bonds, which are connecting to the silicon. These are super fine little wires. And um, if you do that sort of angle correction, now they can do species identification up to uh, Thousand, several thousand GeV for iron, or seven, several thousand MeV um, for iron, and they do species identification all the way down um, to 100 keV, <coughs> and that's just by stacking silicon. So, like I said, silicon by itself doesn't tell you what the particle is, but you use a whole bunch of them together, and you can learn a lot more. 
that requires you to make them thin enough that you have penetration through them. Um, but it's pretty easy, or it's relatively easy to do that. Um, how am I doing on time? Yeah, this is probably the place where it makes the most sense. So if there's any particle questions, I'm happy to answer those. Or if you want to just take a five minute break, now seems like a good time. I'll get a coffee or something. I just realized I had no clock at some point there. <laughs> um. Okay, um, so I will move on from particles now to fields, electric and magnetic fields. And I say here, each of these deserves a talk in their own right, and I am not the person to give either of those talks. But um, but I've used a fair amount of this data, and, and because I work with particle instruments, I at least know that instruments are fickle things. And if you're going to use data, I highly recommend reading the instrument papers. Um, blindly using data just because it's in a unit that you think you understand, uh, or it's level two, uh, or something like that, uh, should not give you all the confidence in the world that you that the processing is uniform or that the processing is well understood. Um, I highly recommend you read the instrument papers. And if you have questions, 
you know, a lot of times I recommend talking to the PIs. Um, a lot of, they're usually pretty happy to have people using their data and, or, or work, talk to a colleague of yours who um, has worked with similar data and knows some of its um, shortcomings. Yeah? Good, good practice. Um, you know, I, as a person who has built instruments, uh, I love to be uh, included as a co-author, even though I didn't do anything on your paper. Um, but I don't actually think that that's the standard. I think acknowledgments are great things. Um, I think if you got help from the instrument team in sort of understanding what the data was, then I think including them as a co-author is fine. But um, uh, you know, first results papers usually have the whole instrument team, and as long as you cite that or you cite the instrument paper, I think those are, are you know, relatively good things to do. I know that there are people who have different opinions on this and think that you should always include, you know, the whole instrument team on, uh, on your co-authorship. In the broader community or with the PI? Um, you know, I think it's polite to ask, but if if you just pulled the data off a website, and and you're not, you know, getting into the nitty gritty details of how the instrument is responding, you know, I think acknowledgments are probably good enough. So. But as I said, other people have stricter standards on that. So, um, so uh, start with magnetic fields. Uh, magnetic fields, obviously, incredibly important to determine the structure. There's lots of different scales. Um, there are multiple ways to measure magnetic fields, usually classified by in situ or remote sensing, DC or AC, scalar or vector, strong or weak fields. Uh, it seems like it's a hard problem to measure. If you're making measurements around the Earth, you have 60,000 nanotesla base field, and you're trying to measure sort of sub nanotesla slow variation when you're flying around through the Earth's changing field. So you need to have good dynamic range with these instruments. Uh, if you're on Voyager 1 and you've gone out to the edge of the uh, heliosphere, you have adaptive dynamic range as you go out. Um, similar things are happening on Solar Probe Plus for the same reasons. Um, you need to be able to handle wide ranges of fields. And the, a lot of times you can do that in electronics. Sometimes the sensor front end can still saturate. Um, so the simplest one, well, the simplest one is uh, for a magnetic field is a loop of wire. And uh, slightly more complicated is the search coil, which is many loops of wire. Uh, you follow Faraday's law, and you get the curl of the electric field is equal to rate of change of the magnetic field. And you integrate that over the loop, you get a voltage is proportional to the changing magnetic flux. You know, physics two kind of intro stuff. Uh, in practice, of course, it's a little bit harder. Um, <coughs> but uh, if you use a whole bunch of turns and you wrap it around a high mu uh, ferromagnetic core, you can increase your sensitivity. Uh, there's some design trade-offs with the inductance of your coil. Um, and the sensor impedance that you, or the electronics impedance that you hook up to it uh, in different regimes. But more or less, you're measuring a voltage from a changing magnetic flux in a loop. Um, that can be a little tricky because your spacecraft is moving. It's moving in the plasma. And uh, if it's spinning, it's also got a, uh, uh, a, DBT, DB, a changing magnetic flux due to that. And so you need to separate these all out. Um, but it, it can be done, especially if you're only interested in high frequency fields, which is where search coils tend to get used. This is what a sort of simple picture of one. This is equivalent circuit down here with uh, just a voltage readout. Right? So um, I won't say that this is an easy design. Uh, but it's a pretty simple physics principle, right? Uh, so uh, the, the RLC, if you know your electronics, um, this is going to create some resonances. And so this is a damping resistor over here. 
Um, and because of all of that, your frequency response is going to, uh, your sensitivity or your noise or, or many things as a function of frequency is going to vary substantially. And a lot of times, like I said, you'll get that level two data and it will all be normalized. It will have detector response taken out of it. Um, but especially on the edges of that range, you should be careful about using it uh, blindly. So the next kind is a flex gate magnetometer. And uh, flex gate has been used for a long time. Um, the principle relies on magnetic hysteresis. Unlike the search coil, which is good at high frequency, the flux gate is good at lower frequency. Right? So hysteresis, if you remember, you probably saw this same curve somewhere. You apply a magnetic field, and you get um, magnetization in your metal. Um, you're applying a field here. This is a measure of your magnetization. And what happens is it gets saturated. Right? You can't get any more magnetization, even if you continue to apply a stronger field over here. And you reverse your applied field and you follow the curve back and you saturate in the other direction. You don't go through the origin after the first time. <laughs> okay, That's pretty simple. Um, doesn't really tell me much about the external magnetic field, though. But what if I apply a field in the presence of an external field? What that does is it's going to shift this curve in the direction of the external field. I apply a known field, but I shift this curve in the direction of the applied field. And so now it's got an asymmetry to it. Right? That asymmetry is, um, is going to happen, or let me just step back. This is my applied field with what we call an excitation coil. Wrapped around the same core, I have a pickup coil. This looks an awful lot like <coughs> a transformer. Um, but normally, you don't want to saturate the cores in your transformers. What we do here is we saturate the cores repeatedly at high frequency. Right? We drive this core into saturation in both directions. And the time it takes to saturate in the direction opposite the field, opposite the external field, is longer than the time it takes to saturate in the direction that, um, that the field is going. Right? So what we get, if I have no external field, I have this symmetric um, applied excitation waveform, and I get a flux gate output. This is saturation in one direction, saturation in the other direction. This is what my pickup coil is measuring. If I do that in the presence of an external field, h is greater than 0, what you can see is I get longer time here, shorter time here. By measuring that time difference, or in practice, Doing, um, looking at the second harmonic, the amplitude of the second harmonic, you can, you can relate that back to how much of a shift. Right? If the external field is really large, I'll get a very short pulse in one direction and a much longer pulse in the other. Right? And just by looking at that time difference effectively, I can measure the external magnetic field. I do this in three axes, three independent axes, and I can measure the DC magnetic field remarkably well. Once I have the DC magnetic field, if I distribute those around in a bunch of different points, this is the cluster tetrahedron, I can measure the magnetic field at each of these. I can estimate the, the current through each of these surfaces uh, using curl B equals mu naught J. This is called the curlometer technique. It's, not, it's somewhere in between an in situ and a remote sensing. Um, you're using a, uh, an in situ measurement of the magnetic field and you've got this sort of slightly distributed array. MMS is doing this, obviously, as well. It's flying in the same sort of tetrahedron. If you know, go now to Solar Probe Plus, this is what it looks like. Here's the way the magnetometers are going, right? I haven't said this explicitly, but magnetometers pretty much always go out on booms. Right? They're separated from the spacecraft because there's lots of electrical currents happening up here, and the magnetometers want to get as far away from that as possible. So here's the magnetometer. Um, the flux gate magnetometers, mag I, mag O, on Solar Probe Plus. Here's the search coil magnetometer uh, uh, stuck out here even further away. Oftentimes, you do see this sort of inner and outer. Um, sometimes you use that in what's called a gradiometer mode, where you're using the fact that there's a 
These should be measuring the same natural fields, but mag i will be far more susceptible to the spacecraft created fields. And so by looking at the difference there, I can make a much cleaner measurement. Also for Solar Probe Plus, I believe this is partly redundancy. They go through, through slightly different electronics chains. Um, and so uh, they're trying to make sure that they always have a good measurement of the DC magnetic field, even if one were to fail. And again, this is just like in particle detectors. You're using many, many different sensors to cover this whole range of uh, natural phenomena. So this is now frequency on the x-axis. Uh, this is sort of uh, nanotesla per root hertz, a measure of the field strength. And you can see the flux gate is good down at low frequencies. The search coil magnetometer is one nominal instrument, but it's split into a low frequency and a high frequency uh, sensors. And each of those is covering a different energy or a different uh, frequency range. So you cover from uh, DC out to 100 kilohertz pretty well. And that covers most of the natural phenomena that they're trying to look at. So measuring the electric field is a little bit different. Um, there, are, there are other tech. Oh, I want to say one more. There is also sort of an absolute magnetometry, um, which uh, it takes advantage of like proton precession or helium precession or emission of light from excited rubidium, uh, things like that. And then you get an, a great absolute value of the scalar magnetic field, total B. Uh, it's very precise. It tends to be used on um, some planetary missions. Uh, it's getting developed further, and if you then put a system like that inside coils that um, apply a changing field, you can measure uh, vector magnetometry with it. But it's certainly not the most direct. All right, electric fields. Um, electric field sounds really easy, in fact. I'm going to call this a total oversimplification. You put a probe in a plasma, it approaches the plasma potential locally, you subtract the plasma potential measured at one probe versus the other. You divide by the distance and you have the electric field. Right? By definition, that's true, right? Um, in practice, it's a lot harder than that. Um, the connection of the probe to the plasma is strongly dependent on, uh, on what your plasma conditions are. So you can have a substantially different behavior in a high density plasma where your connection, your sheath impedance is something like uh, a mega ohm or 10 mega ohms. But in the magnetosphere, in tenuous plasmas, uh, you can get you know, a giga ohm of input impedance to your measurement. Right? And that's really hard to deal with. You can overcome some of that by applying a bias current so that you're adjusting the potential out here. Um, so that it is more in contact with the plasma. Um, and then effectively you can drop your, your sheath impedance. There's also a capacitive coupling to the, P, to the impedance, or to the plasma, excuse me. Um, and that's going to change strongly whether or not you're using what's called these spherical double probes where you have an amplifier out in a little ball at the end of your measurement point. Um, or you have just antennas, like in the case of solar probe, where the whole length acts as a capacitive coupling to the plasma. Um, there, are, there are big trade-offs in how you choose to design these. Um, and one of the things that is sort of most, uh, most difficult about them is, is maintaining symmetry. If your systematic error is the same on this probe as it is on this probe, you don't care. Uh, because it's a subtraction. So the systematic uh, voltage potential difference between the probe and the actual plasma potential is, um, is something that just disappears. But if you're biased in some way um, by differential photo emission or uh, large gradients or uh, spacecraft wake or slightly different preamps, and then you do the subtraction, you measure an electric field when there is none. So it's, it's one of these fine art measurements. Um, but, the, but the physics of it is very simple. You are connecting 
somehow uh, point your, uh, to the plasma potential. You're measuring the same way you do with a voltmeter the voltage difference between the spacecraft and the probe and the spacecraft and the other probe, and you're doing a subtraction. Um, now, it's a tough measurement, as I sort of tried to say there. One of the things that you do is you make that length be as large as possible. Right? Um, the longer your length, the better your signal to noise. So longer booms increase measured potential difference for a given E field strength. That's because it's um, E is delta phi over L. Uh, longer booms decrease the magnitude of spacecraft related noise sources and, um, and sensor related noise sources. But long booms add a ton of moment of inertia to your spacecraft. And so um, it, can be, it can be very difficult for the rest of the spacecraft to accommodate very long booms. So, um, so wire booms, very thin wire booms, have become the thing to do if you want to get long separations with uh, very little mass uh, in the booms. And I'll say even wire booms add significantly to the moment of inertia. So why use double probes? There's another technique out there that I think is actually super cool, uh, but doesn't work at sort of higher frequencies. Uh, it's the electron drift technique. Um, it has a much lower effect on spacecraft potential and can be a cleaner measurement in some way, but it has no AC response. Um, when, when dynamic things are happening, electron drift instruments can be um, confused. <coughs> this potential difference me method that I'm mostly going to talk about, it has a good AC response from, or good DC response up to a good AC response. It's possible to get a 3D measurement. Uh, electron drift is sort of more naturally a 2D measurement. This requires a spinning spacecraft um, and uh, pretty strongly influenced by the local environment that you're perturbing with your spacecraft. Um, why do you put a spherical double probe out on the end? Well, um, spheres have lots of symmetry. Um, so in terms of matching the two different um, sides of this to have similar photo currents and similar properties, um, photoelectron currents, uh, and similar um, ion and electron fluxes onto the sensor, a sphere is nice because um, it's really easy to make them almost identical. Uh, you tend to coat these with uh, uniformly dirty things that have a high work function to try and minimize the solar uh, photoelectron current um, and, and try and make the surfaces completely identical between the two probes. But another choice is just to have a bare wire out there or a, cylind a cylinder at the end of your boom. These have better AC response um, because they have effectively capacitive coupling along their whole length. Um, but uh, the fact that as you change your rotation angle, you're getting a different amount of uh, photoelectron current means that you get a spin modulated photoelectron current. Uh, and that, uh, that can be hard to remove, especially if you're interested down to DC frequencies. Um, the spacecraft is doing a lot of things. The spacecraft has its own cloud of photoelectrons. In fact, it's got significantly more area than the probe sensors do. So they're creating tons of photo current. Right? And some of that could find its way out to your sensors and influence the potential that it's experiencing or the potential it's trying to measure. Um, you have changing electron and ion fluxes. You have photoelectrons created by the boom itself coming onto the sensor. You have this spacecraft wake. You have the whole system sort of uh, shorting out the, um, the potential measurement, right? When you go with your voltmeter and you're trying to measure the potential difference between two points and somebody else shows up with a wire and connects them, uh, you no longer have a valid measurement. Well, that's kind of the regime this is operating in. There's potential um, currents from sort of your measurement unit out to your sensor. And so that can change the measured value of the potential. Um, Differential charging, um, 
again, I, on the sensors, you try and have a uniform surface properties. Um, and the spacecraft wake certainly is, um, is important as well. So that's going to change the potential around the spacecraft. Um, for solar probe, the spacecraft wake is something I, I just have never even thought of before. I mean, it's incredibly intense um, because the velocities are large uh, <laughs> and the densities are large. So um, I have to say they put a lot of thought into that if you read through those instruments. So uh, sort of verbose slide here. Um, this was for uh, RBSP EFW uh, description. So their requirement was something like 0 0.1 millivolt per meter. They also had to measure up to several hundred millivolts per meter. So you're talking about um, three plus orders of dynamic range. Um, and effectively, at the low end here, you're talking about a 10 millivolt signal difference between your two probes um, divided by the length, or tens of millivolts. Um, and uh, that pretty small signal in the presence of lots and lots of common mode and systematic noise. Um, what you're actually working against or with is the IV curve of the sensors. This is the amount of current flowing onto it versus the potential it reaches. Uh, ultimately, the currents will all balance out to zero onto the sphere, and it will achieve whatever potential it needs to in order to be at net zero current. Right? If there's a large photo current, uh, uh, a large photo, uh, photon flux, the, um, the surface will emit a lot of photoelectrons. That's, uh, that is a current. If it will gradually then charge up positive so that it will then attract back those photoelectrons or some percentage of those photoelectrons. Right? So it will change its potential to match, to eventually set the net current to zero. Um, you can influence that process. You can make that uh, process faster by um, shoving current out into the sensor. Right? So you apply a current from the spacecraft to the sensor so that it is in better connection with the local plasma. Uh, you need to have a high effective source. Well, you have a high effective source impedance. That's 10 to the sixth ohms, sort of mega ohm, 10 mega ohms. Um, and so you have to have electronics that can measure something that um, isn't going to give you a lot of current for a given voltage difference. Right? And there's, as I said, a real art to um, sort of calibrating these things and a, a um, and making them as clean as possible, you control the potential on a lot of other surfaces around the spacecraft. Right? The simplest one, I think, to understand is this guard surface, where you will usually apply somewhere in this zone a negative potential. Right? So you bias some spot out here to minus 20 volts or something like that. And that is going to take the photoelectrons that want to come from the spacecraft to your sensor and repel them. It's going to re take the photoelectrons from your sensor and keep them local to your sensor. Right? So you're putting sort of an imposed potential difference here to, to keep these plasma populations separate, to keep their connection to the plasma separate. Right. Um, having different orthogonal boom lengths. Uh, for RBSP, it's 80 and 100 meters, tip to tip. Um, allow one to detect the presence of wake effects. As you spin, you can see um, uh, at 100 meters, you measure one thing, one electric field in this direction, and then half a spin or a quarter spin period later, you measure a different electric field in that direction. That's usually a wake effect. This is what the electronics often end up looking like. So you have your sphere. It's got its connection to the plasma is through the sheath. Um, you have your preamp out here in the sphere so that you can transmit your signal down the whole length of that 50 meter cable um, without uh, losing it. You have a whole lot of electrons to electronics to bias things like the, um, the guard. Like I said, you can adjust the negative potential out here. This is about where the guard would be in this. Um, I believe. Um, 
so that you can sort of minimize after you launch the uh, systematics of, uh, of differential photocurrents and, and uh, isolate the, the plasma environments you're measuring. This is what it ends up looking on an actual satellite. This is, again, Themis. Um, here's this really long, in this case, um, uh, it's going to be here somewhere, 25 meter or 20 meter, depending on uh, the 20 meter one would be, say, coming out of the page, and this would be the 25 meter, 25 meter in that direction. Uh, you can get a three-axis measurement of the electric field. I'm on a spinning spacecraft. This is a fine wire. This is a really um, strong, we'll say, uh, wire going out uh, 25 meters. I can't do that well along the spacecraft spin axis. Right? There's no centrifugal force to keep the wire boom deployed as the spacecraft's moving around. So here I use rigid boom. These are called stacer booms. Um, and tip to tip for Themis, uh, it ended up being almost eight meters separation, so not nearly as good as the 50 meters possible separation in the, uh, in the spin plane. Um, MMS has, I think, longer um, axial booms. They sort of do like a multi-stage boom deployment. Um, but still, axial electric fields tend to be noisier, uh, tend to be uh, less sensitive, um, and so careful using them. Um, how do you get that uh, boom out there? Well, you have, you have a little garage door, it a sensor sits inside the, this, and reels itself out, sort of as you gradually spin up the spacecraft and, and reel them out, um, you get something like 20 newtons uh, tension on your wire, which is you know, a metal wire should be able to hold up two kilograms. Um, but uh, occasionally, they've had wires snap. Um, so it's, uh, it's something that goes very carefully into the design. Um, these numbers up here, I like to point out because you know, if, you, if, you add, if you think about it, 380 kilogram meter squared of moment of inertia when it's, when it's deployed, or for RBSP, uh, 2,000 kilogram meter squared. Um, just this length really adds to your moment of inertia. Right? So uh, the scientists or some DC electric field scientists, they want to make these as big as possible. Spacecraft designers say as short as possible, and, and they get the butt heads for a little while. Um, again, as I said earlier, the total, the total current onto the sensor sphere is going to end up being zero. Um, you're in control of this current. Uh, the plasma electrons are um, are being uh, impinging on the sensor, the plasma ions. You have some that are being reflected, some that are, are, uh, are not, depending on what the sensor potential is. Same with the photoelectrons. You can see the photoelectron current for negative probe potentials is, um, is by far the highest. Uh, and then up at positive probe potentials, which um, you don't always get to, um, you get you know, the opposite behavior, where the, the plasma um, is now your most significant, plasma electrons is now your most significant current. Um, so you get, to, you get to control the bias current, which lets you sort of set this in, a, in a, the most sensitive part of, um, of, the, uh, of the instrument response. But um, this number will change over the course of an orbit, or a month, or the lifetime of a spacecraft. right? And you are putting a lot of faith in the instrument team to do that appropriately and adjust the response appropriately. So around the times these adjustments happen, um, a lot of times there's a bad data flag. Uh, some of my students don't like to look at bad data flags. Uh, I highly recommend you look at bad data flags so you don't go down a rabbit hole. Um, uh, sort of the equivalent circuits, this is the sheath impedance and the capacitive coupling to the sheath. And then you have your cabling and the input uh, impedances of your um, amplifier. How this all works out is at DC electric fields for a spherical probe where you have the preamp out there, you have good gain. Um, 
at AC fields, AC electric fields, you have a roll off, right? You have this frequency dependent response. And for, this is again Themis, um, you have, uh, let's see, uh, it's a little hard to see, but one of these is gonna be axial, um, and one of these, uh, yeah, axial AC gain is about 0.45. Here, this is green as the, that axial boom, the stacer boom, and red is the spin plane booms. So at DC, you have this good flat gain. You have this mystery region, um, and then you have your sort of AC gain, and it's good up to about 10 kilohertz there. You can design it to go a little higher, but um, there's always trade-offs. Uh, this region right here is, um, is one of the most ambiguous. Um, you can choose where this is based on choosing uh, values over here, but um, again, always trade-offs. And I'm sure you know, your most favorite wave ends up being somewhere around 100 hertz. Um, it, then you have trouble with this instrument. Uh, but <coughs> uh, there is some uncertainty in that crossover region. But it's nice to have flat gain in sort of your AC region and then your DC region. At Solar Probe Plus, again, all of this frequency response is set by the ratios in this uh, equivalent circuit where R sheath is the sheath impedance. Um, C sheath is mostly determined by the geometry of your uh, probe, and so it doesn't tend to change nearly as much. Um, but R sheath depends a lot on the Debye length and the density and the temperature. And so for the different uh, perihelions, the frequency response of Solar Probe Plus is going to be um, moderately different. And I think that's something that, um, that people will have to, I mean, again, you can trust the science te the instrument teams to calibrate the data, and you know, you don't, I don't encourage people to go recalibrate the data unless they have a whole lot of expertise, but um, it's worth thinking about the fact that uh, you're putting faith in the instrument teams. It's nice to know that uh, you can't just compare uh, the closest perihelion to the quarter AU. Yeah. Trust but verify. I think that's, uh, that's, that's what the people at the airport ask me. That's, what, that's, that's why I got that TSA pre, right? Uh, but uh, uh, yes, you, it is important. I mean, there's no way we're all going to go reanalyze data. Right? You have to trust. Um, but if you go find something incredibly interesting, it's worth double checking. It's worth talking to the instrument teams. Um, it's worth making sure that you know um, what you're looking at. Um, during quiet times, you can use sort of ideal MHD, E equals negative V cross B, and intercalibrate your electric field and your uh, magnetic field. So, you get sort of the E from the V cross B uh, on one axis right here, and you get the measured electric field from the double probe here. And you can see the fit is uh, almost always going to be um, slightly less sensitive using the electric field instrument. Right? So, um, so why do we do this double probe technique? It's because we have, um, we are most interested in disturbed measurements. Right? Uh, this, can, this calibration can be done at quiet times, um, but uh, if you want high time resolution measurements and you want it done um, at disturbed times, the axial double probe is, is a good way to do it. Um, these instruments also tend to give you a, a measurement of density and temperature, uh, like a, because they're effectively related to Langmuir probes or R Langmuir probes, depending on frequency regime. Um, and so you get a spacecraft potential measurement. Um, and this is, I think, um, this is now comparing the measured ion density in an electrostatic analyzer to the spacecraft potential. And, um, and you can see most of the spread here is actually temperature of the plasma spread. Um, but there are lots of theoretical curves that go through here um, that allow you to effectively measure the density using your electric field instrument. There are other ways to effectively measure the density 
using your electric field instrument, you can measure the upper hybrid lines or the plasma, plasma frequencies um, and get the density from there as well. So uh, it's a, it's a uh, sort of for free measurement if you're going to go measure the electric field anyway. Um, I guess that's my, the end of my talk. I don't know. I, th I think I'm a little early, but on a Saturday morning, hopefully. No, I'm right on time. Well, that's a miracle. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to say it again. Read the instrument papers. Um, contact instrument PIs. Trust but verify. I think that's a good phrase. I liked it. Um, keep in mind the ranges, right? Instruments are confined in some way. They're confined to a frequency range or to a sensitivity range. Uh, and we try and push those limits as far as we can. But uh, every instrument is limited in some way. And one, one of the ways we take care of that is by having different instruments. And we try and make them overlap. And overlapping allows us to do uh, intercalibration. Right? So the high end of mag ice low overlaps with the low end of mag ice medium. And the low end of uh, isis high, uh, high low overlaps with isis low high, and things like that. Um, so that allows you to sort of try and bridge these, these regions. Um, but intercalibration is important. Uh, think about contamination and what could be contaminating your measurement. Uh, certainly, as spacecraft age also, electric field instruments tend to be susceptible to aging. Um, the Faraday cups do not, right? So you can't just blindly apply the same connection between two instruments at the beginning of life and at the end of life. Um, I didn't really talk much about saturation, but particle detectors have maximum counting rates. And uh, if you see a flat line at a pretty high value, it's probably not a flat line. It's probably an instrument that is choking uh, on way too many particles. Um, if you see a, a plot that's in flux units um, and it's wildly oscillating, like pose, wildly oscillating from 100 to 200, that's because Particles don't measure, or particle detectors don't measure flux. They measure counts. And they have geometric factors, right? And the Poe's geometric factor is 0.01. So if it's wildly oscillating from 100 to 200, that's not a wave. That's 1 to 2. And that's Poisson statistics, right? That's 1 plus or minus 1 showing up in your data stream, right? So, um, just because you may not be a, an instrument person um, and you only want to work in flux space, it's good to know where your instrument is saturating and where your instrument is close to its one count level. Right. Um, and again, go read instrument papers. Many thanks to the instrument papers that um, I stole from for this talk. Okay. Oh, they can. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of times it's uh, not necessarily in the sensor itself, but in the electronics that are downstream. Um, and so a lot of the magnetic field ones employ automatic gain switching so that they apply less gain when they're in the presence of a large signal. Um, but uh, but it's, so it's less of an issue, um, but there are occasionally transition regions that, um, that it happens in. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I should repeat the question. I still want to. Re I want you to repeat the question, and then I will repeat the question. So you mentioned that the ion resolution Ah, yes. The, why does why does the electric uh, EDI or electric uh, electron drift instrument have lower time resolution? Um, uh, 
Well, so the way I didn't get into it at all, but the way an electron drift instrument works is it's actually measuring E cross B over B squared. So you know B, uh, and you shoot an electron beam out of your spacecraft. It has a gyro radius. And because it's got an E cross B drift, um, you can then measure where it shows up and the uh, angle of arrival of that, um, of that beam. And that, um, that displacement along where you shoot it from and where you measure it uh, at is related to E, from E cross B over B squared. But you have to rely on the field sort of remaining static while you're making that measurement. Right? And so uh, EDIs, you can get measurements at like 10 hertz kind of reliably, um, but it's not the sort of thing that you can change rapidly and measure rapidly. You're tracking an electron gun and tracking it where it shows up. And you actually need two electron guns to do a little bit of triangulation. Um, so it's a complicated measurement. It's good for re removing some of the systematics of the double probe techniques. Um, or some of the errors that are inherent in the double probe techniques. But when, when the fields are changing rapidly or when there's large gradients in the field, um, it can be a difficult technique. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've never built either of them. Um, the, uh, both impose plenty of requirements on the spacecraft. I know that. So uh, that's probably the, the hardest thing to say. Thank you. Well, <laughs> uh, instrumentalists get together over beers and they say, oh, I hate it when people use my data without understanding the instrument. So, um, so this is, you know, I was happy to do this. This is my pleasure. 